Hello. Uh, my name is Kostas. Uh, thanks very much for attending. It's been like three years since I've done like the last presentation. So please excuse me. I'm kind of like feeling a little bit rusty. Uh, so today we'll be talking a little bit about uh, what we call dense constant retrieval, uh, essentially neural sets uh, by model neural sets. Uh, we we're supposed to do the presentation with my colleague Lily, but unfortunately she couldn't actually attend due to personal reasons. So I'll do the presentation myself. Uh, a little bit of introductions. Uh, we're coming from Code AKI, a startup, uh, London based startup, which uh, is actually focused on uh, doing cultural, cultural intelligence. Uh, we have a cultural intelligence platform. Uh, I'm Kostas, heading up the DSM team, and like I said, we're supposed to have the presentation along with Lily, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, Lily couldn't actually make it. So this presentation, this talk actually, is split in three parts, right? So we'll uh, uh, talk a little bit about the concept of, uh, of the search engine, like uh, multimodal uh, content. We'll touch a little bit uh, methodologies, neural search uh, techniques, and we'll talk a little bit about scaling. So this is a fascinating topic because it brings together uh, pretty much uh, state-of-the-art deep learning uh, uh, research and models. No, it's not sentient yet. <laughs> so, and, but also at the same time, uh, it also um, brings like many challenges in terms of scaling and uh, like multiple choice you have to actually make it uh, make it work, uh, so yeah, so like just to get like a very basic uh, architecture. So we have like multiple data streams, which all end up uh, in like a single storage, and we on top of that we have an interest ontology, which essentially uh, reflects concepts, uh, segments, interests, and from there on we have like different products uh, like dashboards and so on and so forth, which we serve to our clients. And what we need to do essentially uh, is to allow uh, our uh, experts to be able to uh, browse and search this content. Just to get you uh, a little bit uh, like a, of a notion of, uh, of the scale we're talking about here, we have more than 7 billion texts, images, and videos. And like I said, we need to actually allow people to find useful information in this stored content. And we need to make it reasonably fast, where reasonably here means that we are not query heavy. We're, uh, for our size, we are content heavy. And we need to make it reliable in the sense that we need to, uh, to make it uh, work well and actually result uh, in like reasonable uh, responses. Oh, well, of course, uh, the project code name is yet another cat detector because this is how we test it. <laughs> and we, I personally like very much cats. And we'll just, just jump into the dense retrieval part. Now, again, this is a multimodal search engine and actually combines text and images, right? And actually can go further than that. So, whereas, I mean, it would be very straightforward to use an inverted index like Elastic Serial Solar. Uh, to store and uh, search uh, this content. I uh, do also have images, and the, the visual part is very, very important. And uh, the last few years, there's a massive uh, research going on, like a, fair, um, um, like a vast amount of new models uh, in uh, and advances in neural search, uh, or 10 search, whatever you prefer. Uh, I won't give like too much explanation of the, of the two, Top two, but uh, just put in like a uh, just on the document for uh, for reference, and I also have like a slide for a very of a very very good talk called uh, recent advances in neural sets was like ten days ago. Uh, but uh, I guess the main distinction for the two first is that you need to build train a model on your data to be to to predict relevance based on query. So there's you know like a f yet another prediction part after you submit the query. Whereas we we'll focus on the bioencoders model, which essentially you take your content, whatever the content is, and you're going to do a vector. Okay. So, and then in that vector space, you can use distance metrics to retrieve content based on your query. And this is exactly like the, the pipeline for the neural bioencoder uh, processing uh, steps. So you get the content, uh, you just pass it from a neural network. We'll get to that in a bit. 
uh, you get uh, the vector output, you store the vector content key value pairs, and then at query time, uh, you just repeat the same, uh, the same process. You code your query as a vector, and then you calculate similarity between your query vector and the entire storage. Uh, and then you just return the top k most similar elements. And then, reasonably, uh, you need to scale it to a billion of documents. Now, notice that it's exactly the same as the FIDF, right? So, but here, the encoding phase is done by neural model. So, there's difference, like a vast amount of models out there can actually potentially use to even train together uh, from like uh, computer vision models uh, like ResNet-like or BERT-like and um, transformers and everything. But uh, for our sake of like this demo, we're using OpenClip, which is an open version of, of OpenAI's Clip. It's a little bit confusing, but uh, I have you like the links uh, on the bottom. And uh, the, the entire idea about uh, Clip is uh, what uh, the uh, OpenAI team is calling constructive language image pre-training. So they have an image, and they're uh, presenting the network with like a large uh, set of uh, potential uh, text, text sets that this uh, image would be paired to. And then they ask the model to predict what was the, the right sentence, which I was actually paired with this image. Right. And at the end of the day, what you get back is uh, a model that can encode in the same vector space, an image, and or a text. Uh, I'm not sure if you're uh, um, familiar with, with Clip. We'll just see like a little bit in uh, an example. Now, uh, Open Clip is just something like a vast, again, like configuration of additional models, like much, many more from the original OpenAI's uh, model, which you can like, actually pick up and play along. Now, uh, the configurations, uh, I would say, it's like, in our case, uh, it's like you can actually get open clip, you can like potentially fine tune it in your own domain, and encode images and text in the same vector space. And then you can actually compare images and text in all possible combinations, right? You can actually use text queries, you can actually uh, use image queries, and you can get the back, result, back results, uh, images and text. So you have like all four po uh, possible combinations. Uh, in that particular flavor of the model we're using, uh, the dimensionality uh, of the vector space is uh, 5 to 12, so that's like a reasonable uh, vector uh, size. And the comparisons, how do we do the comparisons? It's, uh, it's uh, typically a dot product between the query vector and your entire database. And then you're just picking up the top most similar uh, vectors and report them back to the user. Uh, now, using uh, a open, open clip, it's completely straightforward to, uh, to encode an image and get back a vector. So you're using like, like preprocess a function, you just open the image, uh, and then you just pass it and code the image and you're getting back a vector. And then you normalize the, the vector to ensure like, uh, it's like a unit norm, unit length, sorry. And then you repeat that with the text, right? Now you have a system that you know, you, it can take a, any text uh, or any image and project all this uh, content into the same vector space. And then you need to also store uh, content uh, uh, metadata, uh, like dates, sources, and so on and so forth for, for post-processing and post-filtering, like in the similar way you would do, for example, in Elasticsearch. We'll see a little bit uh, like an example <laughs> on that in a bit. And then uh, you have to somehow calculate the similarity. There's the brute force way, right? Calculate the dot product of the, the query uh, with the like, entire stored uh, content. And then uh, the, uh, the top k most similar uh, like content type items. This can be done by either directly multiplying the query vector with the matrix of the content, if, you, if it's you have like enough memory to keep it in memory. Uh, and then you can actually use like a top k cal to get back the, the, the k results you want. Or you can actually use a, a k nearest neighbors library or an approximate k, k nearest neighbors library. We'll see that like in a bit. Now, the problem here is that uh, the complexity grows linearly with the number of documents. So, uh, and depending on your domain, 
um, the time uh, to get the results back might not be acceptable if you scale to billions of documents. And we need ways to, uh, to work around that, like to resolve uh, this problem. Uh, now, the same can happen with videos and long text. For videos, just sample phrase in the video and store the uh, file. So in a potential query, if you have, even if you have multiple, uh, say, uh, instances of the particular video, just group them together and just respond to the video. And same for longer, uh, longer texts because uh, Clip, I think they're uh, using like 72 or 73. Uh, tokens, like they're short because they're supposed to be actually uh, trained on uh, photo uh, like descriptions on open data sets. You can just like chunk your text and uh, pass it like, through the model multiple times and store it, and that will do. That will do. So now you have uh, a system that is able of uh, indexing uh, long text, uh, images, and videos. And now we're going to the, the third part, which is uh, scaling. Like we said, query complexity is proportional to the number of uh, stored documents. So for smallest uh, indexes, query times are pretty reasonable, like, uh, like half a second even for, uh, for millions of docs. Uh, but as the index grows, we need to make a trade-off between accuracy and latency. And then again, what that does uh, mean in reality is heavily dependent on your domain of like the, of your, um, um, like, business domain, like uh, in the problem you solve. It's uh, sometimes accept acceptable to have you know, like response time like one or two seconds for an internal tool, but it's not uh, completely uh, acceptable if you, or not acceptable at all if it's you know, like a, um, an open tool and everyone that anyone can use. Uh, so we need to fall back to approximate uh, and search method, methods. So like there's a bunch of things uh, in uh, um, out there that can be used to uh, to help us get the results in like large indexes. Uh, there are three major categories. Uh, it's like hashing techniques, uh, uh, three techniques, and uh, uh, trick and tree and com compression techniques, I would say, and graph techniques. So like it's all one has like very nice uh, properties and can work like in several certain scenarios. So the first one, I guess, is uh, locality sensitive hashing, which is, I guess, one of the most common and older uh, techniques out there. And the core idea is to uh, map singular vectors to singular buckets. So you're defining a hash function, which is uh, like with high probability, similar vectors will end up in the same, the same bucket, and then you repeat the same for your query, and then you just like scan on uh, on the particular bucket where your query falls. Uh, uh, there's a nice uh, mathematical background in this technique, but in reality, uh, it's not that great in performance uh, in real world applications, compared at least to product quantization and HNSW, which we'll talk just in a bit. Uh, Protein equalization essentially is like a, a compression method, right? So you define a cookbook and then you try to map your vector like in a uh, like very short uh, uh, map of symbols, which is essentially a compression form. And there's like a, an obvious uh, issue, which can be an issue actually, that uh, the original vector is not stored, so you need to additionally store it. Uh, if you want to use it in your application, uh, then you do approximate uh, distance search. And the nice thing is like, uh, it's a very fast method and scales well to billions of documents in a single machine, uh, especially if you have um, like memory uh, limitations, right? Like it's extremely memory efficient. And uh, the last method, which is, I think it's one of the most common these days, uh, it's called uh, hierarchical navigable small worlds. And uh, essentially, you're just getting all your documents and you represent them as a proximity graph. Uh, the graph uh, is built in a way to actually fold the small world property of graphs, which is essentially uh, means which essentially means that you have low average distance between your nodes, but you also have at the same time uh, high clustering. So, and that's very, very uh, useful. 
because essentially the way it works, you just start with a random node in your graph, and with just a minimal number of hops, you're ending up to uh, where the, like, uh, the, the query point, you, uh, you're just trying to find like, a relevant component. And the hierarchical, sorry, the hierarchical part of it is that we're using like a skip list algorithm, which is, comes like in several layers of complexity to make it even faster, which eventually uh, achieves a, comp a query complexity which is roughly proportional or like proportional with high probability to O of uh, log n, which is extremely fast. Uh, which method? Okay, speed and accuracy trade-offs. Uh, what we find is that for smallest uh, indexes with like, uh, say like, in the vicinity of one million documents, uh, no approximate methods are usually required. Still very fast, it can actually produce, like I said, uh, results in like less than a second in, or if you even use like a GPU unit faster than that. Um, for uh, like document side, which is like in the scale of millions, you can either use uh, product quantization for memory, uh, memory facing indexes if memory is a problem, or uh, you can uh, fall back to uh, HNSW, which is it's it's faster, but it's, uh, especially for like the hierarchical part, consumes uh, large memory. Uh, for billions of documents, things are uh, getting even more uh, interesting, interesting because you need to also quantize your product space. So essentially, you have like different quantizer on your vector space, and on, on top of uh, each one, you have an inverted index. Sorry, like a, a search index, uh, and then when the query comes along, you need to map it on uh, the corresponding uh, uh, like space, and then do the search uh, there. And again, you can actually use either uh, product quantization or HN, uh, HNSW. Uh, the interesting part is that you have like a ton of uh, options to play out there. So what uh, people typically do these days, uh, like a couple of very popular libraries, uh, I guess Fies, uh, which comes from, coming from Meta, uh, is one of the most popular. I know it comes from Spotify. Uh, Non-metric uh, space library or an MSLib uh, is also like a very, uh, very useful uh, library. And at the end of the day, uh, if you ask me, it all comes to like, Preferences. Uh, there is also the, invert, uh, uh, the AVF HNSW, uh, which is like inverted indexes plus uh, small word graphs, uh, and the scan library, which comes from Google, which is extremely fast. This one. Uh, now, the interesting thing is like a Slash Search 8.2 also support, uh, supports uh, approximate uh, AKN and search, uh, but it is still in review. So, a simple ex uh, example, FICE comes with like a Python package, so you can actually just pip install it uh, and use it directly. And assuming that you have all your documents already converted uh, into vectors, so uh, you can create an index. In this case, it's a flat index with uh, the L2 uh, norm metric, uh, like a Euclidean distance. You just index all your, uh, put all your documents, all your vectors in the index, and then you just uh, repeat the same with the sets, and this uh, works like fairly well. And you get back the distances and the indexes, like for the top k, like top ten uh, documents. Uh, similarly, uh, in Elasticsearch, you can create a mapping which has uh, like a couple of say uh, fields, and you have um, you can actually define an embedding field which is of type dense vector. You're also defining the number of dimensions you want, uh, 5 to 12 in this case. You want to index it, and you want to use the similarity to compare these uh, elements in that particular uh, type uh, as dot product. And then you, any other information you want to store. And then it's completely straightforward to index documents. Uh, just get you know, like, uh, the vector of uh, like any element um, and just put it on your... like. Uh, on your index, so I'm just using like an MSR uh, index here, and uh, just repeat for all your your content, I guess. And in query time, you have a vector which is generated again by your model, 
And then you can use in the KN query, which you were using back like the field depending, which is like uh, uh, the dense vector. Uh, and the query vector is the vector we have the query vector. Uh, we also ask k to be 10, like the top k results. And the number of candidates actually defines how many uh, documents could be collected per start. They're then bugs and aggregated, and then uh, we report back the, the, the source, uh, like the, the URL source field. Um, returning back to the model now. Uh, and you'll select like that in, in a bit what I mean. Um, large uh, language models and multimodal models can be sensitive to prompts. Right, it's completely different sometimes to explicitly state what you're looking uh, to the model. And for, uh, for example, like a photo of a cat is generally more expressive, just passing like a single word in your model, just cat. And one of the things we've been uh, considering uh, when we're, while we're building the search engine uh, is uh, the option to have pre-built ready to use queries versus allowing free text input uh, to the user. Uh, there is pros, pros and cons, like ready pre-built queries are uh, much more safe in a sense, versus uh, allowing free, uh, free text input to the user can lead to potentially poor results and then uh, uh, that the user won't be happy and so, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's one of other thing you may want to consider depending on your application, uh, which is kind of straightforward actually with neural models is you may want your users to allow flag, to, uh, to flag content as relevant and then use this additional signal with an, another final model, I guess, to finally, like, to, to, like, finally rank your, uh, your results for like, a re re-ranking re step. And there's like advanced information of learning to run for information literal literature out there to actually do that. But eventually, at the uh, at the end of the day, you need a model that will take you know, like the query representation uh, and uh, something that is returned back and will produce a score between zero and one, and can use that for ranking or even you know, like threshold. Um, which appropriate? Uh, which? Um, a and N method is appropriate. Actually, this is not exact science, right? It depends on various factors, such as data volume and the trade-offs like between latency and quality. Uh, data variance is uh, something we find that's like extremely important. Uh, and if you have you know, like completely randomized uh, data, then your results won't be as good. Uh, and if you want to actually just like run and benchmark and see which method works best in your case. Uh, like in a non, in a vanilla norm, like re-ranking scenario, if we consider the output of uh, uh, the exact KNN uh, algorithm as you know, like a, a baseline, then we can actually calculate uh, what's the percentage of the accuracy between different approximate methods and the KNN just to get an option. And then you also need to take off response times and everything, right? And also re-ranking, uh, like the ranking order may or may not be relevant uh, because it can happen that you know, like an approximate method uh, will st still return the, the correct results, but some were lower. Things to consider. Uh, that's, a, that's a very big discussion, actually. It's one of the hottest topics, I guess, in AI research these days. Uh, bias. Uh, all these big fat models learn from data, and data are far from perfect, right? So you need to be very, very, very careful not to inherit uh, in your model, you know, like any uh, race, bias, whatever, like gender, like bias, you can actually uh, exist, and you may most probably not know it in your data. Uh, you also want to potentially filter not safe uh, for work content, right? And that actually, can have like several implications, but uh, it can be a little bit relaxed because sometimes your content can be already uh, filtered. Uh, because if, say, for example, uh, you have like a very reliable source that you know already is not uh, allowing, uh, you know, not safe for content, so you can actually trust that sometimes. Uh, but the nice thing with this model is that you can actually use zero-shot. Like, if you're not familiar with a zero-shot term, it's actually just get like a 
model as it is, and it has the capabilities to solve uh, your problem without training it. Uh, so uh, the, the zero shot scenario in this case, just actually encode the query the same way we're doing like general queries, uh, such as nudity, not safe for work, get the vector, and then now repeat the process with your top K results. And if something scores high, you just refer, uh, remove it. Okay, that's, that's a very straightforward way to do it. Um, but sometimes you may, if you, like, for example, if you're meta Facebook, uh, you can't really allow, uh, like, nudity or uh, any other sensitive content. So you need to have, you know, like, very, very strict machine learning model on top of that. So you may need to build uh, such a model anyway, like, and zero learning, like, zero sort of learning filters, maybe not, uh, maybe they're not, you know, like, the right way, the right solution to your problem. Uh, and it's just a bunch of query examples uh, on, on our data. So if we say, like, if we ask the index a photo depicting the concept of high-end car, I think we're getting, like, pretty good results. Right. Uh, a photo of, of a cocktail drink, also really nice results. And this is exactly actual results from the index. Right. So you are essentially getting the query, text query, and in response back images. Now you can actually reverse that, right, in very, very interesting ways. You can uh, find images by similarity. So you can actually use a query image for that, just upload an image and get like almost similar images. Uh, and or uh, upload an image and get back relevant texts. Right, that's, and that's, that's a very interesting uh, direction in general. And again, a few more examples, like a photo depicting the concept of interior design. That's very useful for uh, our uh, marketing team, I guess. Uh, and more like photography scenario and so on and so forth. I, I use this one, it's a very interesting one, because uh, like a photo of a sunset from the top of a mountain. Can we distinguish uh, easily between sunset and like sunrise? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure what would, uh, uh, would like. And actually, the sunrise wouldn't return like the, um, that good results back. So uh, yeah, that's an interesting thing to, to ponder upon, I guess. Uh, what to go next? Uh, you can actually index audio, but you need to be clever enough or have like waited for the right moment to map audio content to the same vector space. That's a little bit challenging. Uh, you can use potential graph neural networks to learn embeddings on nodes, like social graphs, and index even social graphs or edges, like people who link to each other or have like a propensity to, to like content, so on and so forth. Um, and of course, more data, the more the data, the better the results. That's, that's, that's a, a no-brainer. Like the, especially when you have you know, like high quality images that you want to display or you want to actually use in like presentations or marketing material uh, because the way of like the indexing like the vector space works uh, it typically um, helps a lot to have high quality, high quality and like large amounts of data and they have like a bunch of links that I think you most probably find like super useful. The original uh, OpenAI clip uh, paper, uh, the open clip uh, GitHub repository, the, fa the files wiki from Facebook, from Facebook research, uh, which is like an entry point to pretty much all the research on uh, approximate Canaan uh, literature these days. Uh, uh, also posted like the, the link of the video in a, in a previous slide, uh, advanced neural search and different ways from uh, doc to query to uh, other methodologies and so on and so forth. And there's a very interesting uh, benchmark um, GitHub repository which compares all these like different uh, methodologies of uh, ANN uh, stuff. Contact information and you have uh, any queries, uh, please ask me and thanks very much. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that you had several billions of documents and encoding them into vectors is not cheap. So I'm interested in knowing how did you manage to encode all the vectors and index them? Uh, yeah. 
uh, spark for the rescue, <laughs> right? So you have to actually parallelize it as much as you can, right? I calculated that uh, if we were using like the start of the art, uh, art GPU, we would need to spend like three entire months in a row of like passing the entire content and uh, indexing. Now that's something that can be done if you have you know, like uh, the patience to do it, or you need to scale it and you know, like just uh, map reduce it or whatever and use like multiple GPUs uh, to, uh, to to reduce it like potentially weeks. More questions? Um, really interesting that you've uh, compared these these um, ANN libraries. Um, I have a question regarding that because we we have a kind of a big problem with building the index because we have over the day we have small batches we would need to update in this index. We have multiple millions of, of vectors in there, and I wonder if you just have a hunch which of the libraries would handle that the best. Unless except, <laughs> but you have to wait. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's, I mean, like, the, the internal discussion now is, like, should we uh, proceed with files or, like, some similar, uh, but we take the burden of updating the index, and that may be some of the and so on and so forth, or just wait uh, until, you know, like, or even take the risk of moving forward with Elasticsearch, even if it changes, like, in a bunch of months and you have to actually change your code base. Uh, but, again, that's a decision that is relevant to the risk and uh, the importance of the project you're, build the, uh, you're building. So none of these libraries accept Elasticsearch? You have, to do, yeah, you have to do it yourself, actually. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. the... Okay. The, the caveat. Thanks. Any more questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.